The reasoning behind run and scream is uh, building up your vocal cords, building up your, uh, your inner stamina. You know, for the, the kids to, to be running and screaming at the same time is sort of like almost getting them ready for song. Really, you're only supposed to take one breath, you know, you can run as far as you can, screaming at the top of your lungs. And once you're out of breath and you're done screaming, and you stop right there, and then that's where you, you uh, mark your spot. So, and then the next person in line tries to do this, does the same thing. You know, one breath, screams as loud as they could, and then once they're out of their breath, they stop. And it's just a basic, you know, contest to see who goes the furthest and scream the loudest, I guess you could say. You know, if you just want to do the game quickly, you know, you could find a branch or break off some branches, you know, whatever's available for you that day or in that area or circumstances, I guess you could say, you know. One of the concepts for that game is just to let your, your inner negativity and your stress and everything that's balled up inside of you, just let it go. It's a, it's a stress reliever, you know, you could yell at the top of your lungs and nobody's going to tell you, you know, hey, be quiet. Maybe the kid is frustrated about some, maybe their friends or something like that. You know, they run along and screaming and it makes them feel good. When I make sticks, I, I cut them roughly about about probably I would say six, five to six inches. You know, using um, savas berries, using choke cherries, willows. I really like working with willows because willows have a really great scent, right? I cut a stick about maybe six inches. I make one end sharp so it can stab in the ground. And then I put them roughly about four to six feet apart right behind each other, four sticks. Then the, uh, the participant stands roughly about maybe six to eight feet back. So you use a ball and you stand. And the further you, you hit, the further stick you hit, uh, the more points you get. So the closer stick to you, the less points you get. Now this ball can roll up to the stick or it can just one bounce, however it may be, as long as you make that stick jump. I um, always put some pony beads at the end you know, or some type of beads or something that'll show that that stick jumped, you know what I mean? When I teach throwing games, I always make sure I point. Just like a baseball player, you know, just like a pitcher, he always points to his target. You step with your opposite foot and then you throw. You know, I'm left-handed, so I always point with my right side, I step with my right foot and then I throw so I can have a follow-through, right? And you always come back to as far as you can, you know, you don't just throw it just like this. You know, you always give it your best, right? Come all the way back, point, and then throw. Sling ball is a racing game. Um, so you use a ball with a tail, and you place the tail between your feet, facing away from the direction you want to go, and then you roll backwards and throw your feet above your head and release the tail of the ball, launching it behind you. And you repeat that process until you've completed the race. So the balls that we use here at the International Traditional Games Society are just hacky sacks that we've emptied and refilled with sand inside of a balloon and then sewed a tail onto. The tails that we use are braided yarn, about eight inches long. Kids can find it difficult to, to get the, the tail of the ball firmly between their feet as they go backwards and a lot of times they'll think they threw it really far but they'll find that it's just on the ground at their feet uh, and um, just the initial rolling over a lot of times they'll get really excited about it and go all the way over and it's kind of surprising to them but it's always fun to watch. When I play hoop and arrow, again, I always space children out. If I have more than 12 kids, I double them up. You know, I try to keep my groups as small as possible. You know, if you have 20 kids while well, you partner them up, one kid behind each other, and they just switch every time, you know? And when I usually teach kids to line up in a straight line, I tell them, okay, so when you line up, you put your hands out. And if your hands are touching while well, you're too close, you move over, you know? So it spreads the kids out, so it gives one kid enough uh, room to throw his arrow. Then, 
you would balance that arrow because you always got to find the middle of that arrow. You balance it, then you would hold it. When you throw it, you want it to fly straight, right? So you would always balance it on your hand, then you would hold it like a pencil. And when I play hoop and arrow, I always tell kids, get as low as you can. And even if you want to get on one knee, you know, you get on one knee, you put the opposite knee up, so it'll give you better accuracy. You can throw a sidearm, if that's a lot better, or you can throw just straight over your shoulder. You know, and then when you stand out, you, you, one person stands at the end and he rolls that hoop right to the end. Originally, this was one of the targets that the Salish people use. And what they do is they could throw it and where the students fire into these different holes and obviously this is a bullseye. So they, there's different pointing and there's different ways. In the Blackfoot hoop and arrow game, it's about this size. And so the children would chase the little hoop. So instead of having rows of people shooting from either side as, as the hoop flies down the middle of them, they would have individual where they would each have their own little hoop and then firing with a longer arrow. So we always have to play these games to actually build our skills, right? Build our skills so we can go out hunting, we can feed all our people, you know, we can protect our land, we can protect our animals, everything like that. The children and the students play the game one-on-one -on -one, and they look for this little rock. In the game, the students play for three sticks. So they would start off and they would hide. Some people get really elaborate. They hide under hats or, or uh, scarves and then come out and hide and then point me. It's either this hand or this hand. There's a 50-50 chance. So if you pointed me this way, you would have missed me. Ah! Woo! And I would have got stick. And then if you pointed me this way, you would have guessed me, and I would have had to give my rock to you. So every time that they don't get guessed, they get away, they would earn a stick until they win all three of them. You're, you're observing, you're paying attention to patterns, you're reading the person's body language, but at the same time you listen to your intuition and you learn to trust that if it's telling you that it's in a certain area, a certain, certain place. In these games, our children learn how to get along with each other. They learn how to read people and develop their communication skills. So it could either take a few minutes or up to, some of these games take hours and even days. On the smooth dirt or sand at the edge of the river, the kids would dig a hole in the sand in one place. And then about um, 20 feet down the river, another hole. And the idea of the stone house game is that three river stones that are flat and about as big as the palm of their hands would be placed in there. And that was their house, their teepee, their home. And the idea was to take them to their new home safely, one rock at a time, very carefully. So the oak tokes or rocks were transported to their new home one at a time. They had to be laid down gently, transported gently, laid down gently, and be in exactly the same place as they started. And this was a reflection we understood of how the Plains people 
cared for their possessions as they took them from one place to the next. And home was not a home until everything was in its right place. And it was always transported respectfully and it was always put into its proper place. So when you walked in, it was a complete home. Uh, it was so challenging, the kids and the adults couldn't read the stones that well. And if a stone is fairly round, they couldn't tell it was exactly the same position in the house. So we added pictographs from the region and sometimes the winter count, so they were learning other things, but it helped them visually place those stones in the right place. And so what we're gonna do is one person in your team of three is going to tell a story with the stones and they're going to place them in a particular way and it might be helpful if you think about the directions, north, east, south, and west. And the most important thing is we don't want to hear clicking of the rocks, banging of the rocks, everything is sacred. And then another person is going to be the observer of the story and the placement of the rocks and, what, and then the third person is the judge. They're watching the story be told and they're watching the placement of the rock, so it's really good observational skills. Once the person has told their story and has placed their rocks, then the person that's watching is going to move the teepee over here and move each rock and place it exactly where it was placed. And once all the rocks are placed, you're going to retell the story and the judge is going to be watching to make sure it was done correctly. Um, European variation is called Cat's Cradle, I think that's what it's called, you know, that's what we're playing. We, we made a drum, you can make a teepee. So anytime you would, you would work with these games, you would always tell stories to them, right? Because, because Blackfoot people always told stories to whatever they were taught. When we painted, our paintings always had stories. Um, when we sang, you know, our, so our, there's stories in our songs, right? It builds a child's mind, right? It helps them to be creative to be creative so they can bring out their creativity side. So we tie up two people together, they have to try to get out without, uh, without uh, untying anything. It's pretty fun to watch. Oh, no, no, wait. It was a capturing game. You know, when you capture the enemy, you would tie them up. And if they can get out, well, they can, get, they can go back to their people. But if they, if they can't get out, if they need help, they will just slowly be integrated into the tribe. And it will be adopted into the tribe, eh? That's how you build up your tribe. When, when I do the string games, I always um, emphasize teamwork. I always emphasize uh, communication. I always emphasize uh, brainstorming, you know, so kids can always practice those ways, right? They, all, they always have to work together to solve problems, you know, and, and, and the string game or the capturing game, that's what it's all about, you know. If two kids were bad, well, parents would put them together and they would tie them up, you know, and if they can get out of it, they can get out of it, but it, it helps those children bond. It helps them build a friendship, build teamwork, eh? Oh, we're out. Oh, oh <laughs> You have a, a center pole and that is the goal for, for both teams and it's divided into three sections. The bottom section 
is uh, worth one point, the middle section two points, and the top section three points. And uh, there's a ring around the pole about 10 feet out. And only the youngest children are allowed inside of the ring. And uh, they're able to use any means they can to, to score, to hit that bottom of the, the pole or to throw it to the top. The second um, division uh, of team is the older children. And they have to stay outside of that red circle. But other than that, they can use any means ne necessary to score. Um, the third division is the women, and they have to stay outside of that red circle as well. They can't be rough with the, the lower divisions. Um, they can get in their way, and that's all. Otherwise, they can use any means necessary to score. And the fourth division is the men, who can only get in the way of the lower divisions, who can't, uh, they can't push or be rough with them at all. And in fact, they have to use the, the traditional lacrosse sticks to catch and throw the ball, um, whereas the other divisions can use their hands. The only thing we can do as men is stand our ground. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> if, if one of the women comes up and yanks that stick out of our hand, or one of the kids does, or maybe they get a little rough with you know. Like yeah. grab your arm. You, know? <laughs> you, you really kind of have to just have that humility and accept it, because humility is, a, is one of our our values, one of our teachings. If the men uh, use anything but the sticks, then their points won't count. And a lot of times this results in, uh, this game results in the, the youngest division winning because they can get in that inner circle. And uh, the cool part is that the longer you play it, the more you can see those children developing strategy and the quicker and easier they, they win. So there will be four people playing from each group. Woo! <laughs> So a lot of times these, these games would be used to solve conflict, uh, to avoid any, any type of violence, direct violence. Um, and that would happen in the case of any kind of territorial dispute over, over um, uh, homeland or any kind of grievance that one tribe maybe felt against another as though they were, maybe they were injured by another tribe uh, or a band. And um, so these games would be employed to resolve that conflict. And, uh, and the, sometimes whole tribes would play against each other and you'd have a field that's three miles long with a hundred people on each team and the winner of the game w won the decision of the conflict. Double ball was played with a whole group of kids. You know, it can be played with two tribes. Um, the whole concept of double ball is to work as a team. You know, it's a team game. It's similar to lacrosse. It's similar to field hockey, but it's only played, it's only played with a stick and a double ball, a ball that's basically sold together. There's different ways that people make the double ball. Some people will just cut off two pieces of uh, wood while they're cutting their double ball stick, the double ball stick, and they'll just cut and the two pieces of wood and then join them with a, with a leather or with a sinew. When you start, you would all stand in the middle and you would make a teepee with your stick. Then the ref would throw it in the air and you would catch it, you know? Uh, when we're scoring, if you go under, it's, number, it's one point. If you, the best score is if you can ring the stick like that. And then number two is if you go over the top of it like that. But it has to be within those, those two parameters right there. So you can't come from behind and expect to score.
So in this game, when we play, when we first start out, there's there's multiple different ways that you can do this depending on the tribe and the region. But this is one of the, the most common one that we use. We'll set the ball there and they're going to hit the stick and usually we count, we'll have them count in their language. Wacha, Nupa, Yamini. Okay. Good morning, Star. Way to put them. So with, with these sticks, what we don't want is for people to high swing. So it just usually a general rule is that they stay below their waist. Most of our games, we don't have out of bounds unless it's like a situation where there's a road or something that it might be a safety concern. Otherwise, we um, the, the ball is still in play even if it goes past the, the goals or out, out of the way of the field. Uh, if you score from the back in most of our games, that's a point for the other team. To my knowledge, from what we've studied with this game, is that it's, it is where hockey originated from. There are people that will try to say that hockey originated from Europe, but we have uh, all kinds of historical accounts of this game being played throughout North America. And there are accounts of uh, Dakota boys playing on the ice back in the 1700s. And you're gonna see different variations of it from the regions of where you go. Um, the, the materials in which you use, so this is a cedar shaft that you use from a cedar sapling that would be on the, you know, the western side of the Rocky Mountains. A lot of the Salish people, that's what they use. Over on this side, you would, uh, choke cherry would be common. With the juniper and a choke cherry, the root system naturally curves. So all you do is dig this up, cut it to the length you want, and clean it up and you have yourself a stick uh, and, and just like a lot of our other games it was used for conflict resolution um, community gatherings as many different purposes of why they would play this game